anxious, ready. Okay, folks, we're gonna begin our clinic. Um, just know that the way we have this set up is that uh, the screen is shared, but I wanna be the only one who's on the screen. So somebody has drawn a couple yellow lines and if you could not uh, do that anymore, it'd be greatly appreciated. Okay, uh, hi folks, welcome to the 2023 District 4 Basic Rules Clinic of session one. And what we ask you is that you keep yourself muted uh, for this clinic. At the very end, I'll be happy to talk with anyone live. Uh, the clinic is being recorded, and like all District 4 Rules Clinics, the video recordings will be linked on the umpires page on the District 4 website to the District 4 umpires YouTube page. And there it is at the bottom. Uh, so you can go there and you can catch all of our uh, past videos that we make. So anytime we do a video like this, we always put it on the YouTube page. So what are we doing tonight? Um, well, this is a basic rules clinic for umpires, managers, coaches, staff, and players. Basically, anybody who's involved in Little League uh, is welcome to come to this. The focus is going to be covering rules that are common to all levels of baseball and softball, but we're going to emphasize minors and majors baseball. The reason for that is that we have another clinic that's going to be just on teenage baseball, and we have another clinic that's just going to be on softball. And I'll have a slide in a minute that will announce those. So when we go through these rules, they're common to all levels, baseball, softball. Uh, and we'll point out when it's an emphasis on minor and major baseball. We want to uh, acquaint you with the rule book and we want to cover safety issues. Also, whenever you see red, we're going to be introducing new rules for the upcoming 2023 season. We are not going to be covering the postseason rules. There are some very significant changes, but those will be covered in our rules clinic, clinics right before uh, TOCs and All-Stars. Another thing we want to do, and this will be, you'll see this in purple at times, we're going to introduce the 2023 minor and major divisions interleague rules. Uh, again, if you're in teenage bait, want to follow teenage baseball, those interleague rules will be followed at that clinic, and the interleague softball will be followed at the softball clinic. So we're dividing these rules clinics up into four sessions. I know there may be a little bit confusion on uh, how long these sessions are. We're trying for 75 minutes, roughly about 65 minutes of rules presentation, about 10 minutes of questions. Um, we may go a little bit over, but I'm gonna to try to hold us as close to that as possible. I can absolutely assure you we will never go over uh, an hour and a half. So this is the clinic for February 8th. Uh, I'll go through in a minute what we're gonna be covering, but uh, next Wednesday, same time, uh, we're going to be covering beginning and ending the game, batters and runners. On Wednesday, we're going to be covering on the 22nd, base awards, interference and obstruction. And on March 5th, 1st, we're going to cover the pitcher and the umpire and minor and major league uh, interleague rules. We will go through those uh, one by one during that session. So like I mentioned earlier, we run other clinics too. So we have a teenage baseball rules clinic also done, done on Zoom, probably run about an hour. Uh, you need to register and that's you, easy to register. Just go to the District 4 website and go to the baseball page and you can register for that. And then we also run a softball uh, rules clinic and that's going to be on Monday, February 27th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., this is our one rules clinic that will be live in person. And this will be at the UC Extension office where District 4 has most of all of its meetings these days. That's at 2380 Bissell Lane in Concord. For that one, there's no registration required. And again, for both of these, if you're a coach, if you're a manager, if you're an umpire, uh, please register. Uh, or for the softball clinic, 
just show up. Okay, what are we going to do tonight? Well, we're going to go through the rule book. We're going to talk about the new rules for the 2023 season. Uh, and we're going to talk about regulations. Regulations precede the rules. And there's some very important things in there, like mandatory play. And then we're going to try to get through rules one and two. Uh, one is basically a lot dealing with uh, safety, but also equipment. Rule two is definitions. Uh, we're not going through everything. It's impossible. So we're sort of hitting the highlights. Uh, we're going to highlight those rules with short video clips. We're a little short on the video clips at the first of this um, session, just because these rules don't lend themselves to videos. But once we get going, uh, there will be a lot of video clips that will help explain the rules. And what we're also going to do is answer your questions periodically in the presentation. So there are question periods that are inserted into the presentation. And they'll have a slide that just says, says simply questions. And that's when we'll take the questions. If you have a question, um, what we're asking you to do is use the chat function and type that question in and send it to Don Waddell only. So his name is listed down there. And you don't have to wait till we get to that question period. If I'm going through something and you see a question, you have a question, just send that question to Don, and when we hit the question period, we will cover that, and we'll try to answer every question that you have. Okay, let's get going. So what I first want to do is make sure everybody sort of understands the rules of Little League, and there's actually uh, some different rules that we talk about. We talk about the official playing rules. We talk about local rules, and we also talk about ground rules. So the official playing rules are found in the rule book. There's one for softball, one for baseball, one for challenger. And what you'll find there are regulations, cover things like mandatory play, pitching decorum. And then you'll have the official playing rules in nine parts. Um, objectives of the game, definition of terms, that's what we're going to get through tonight. We're going to try to go through three through seven the next time, except in six and seven, we're going to take out uh, base awards and also obstruction and interference. I think those are two areas that are or, uh, three areas that lead to a lot of confusion, and we want to sort of highlight those and give them their own special uh, do. But these are the official playing rules. This is what a Little League game is supposed to be played by. You can't just make up your own rules, folks, even though folks try. Okay, so what each league can also do is establish what is called its local rules. And Interleague is also has its own set of local rules. Now, local rules covers the areas of the rule book that options are given. In other words, Little League has given le leagues the option, hey, you can play the game this way or you can play it this way. And there's about 10 to 20 different options that Little League allows for. So every league should go through and establish its own local rules. So for you as umpires, for you as managers and coaches, before the season begins, Make sure you know your local rules. Interleague has its own local rules, and we will be talking about those as these rule clinics develop. Um, what are some of these rules? Well, do you want to use a continuous batting order, or do you want to bat nine? Uh, do you want to uh, enforce the rule where a player has to keep one foot in the batter's box? Those are local options. If a local a uh, league wants to establish a rule that's not one of these options and goes against Little League, for example, changing the pitching distance, it has to be done with a waiver process. In other words, there has to be an appeal that makes it all the way up to Little League headquarters and they have to say yes or no to it. So those are the official playing rules. Then we have local rules. Now we have our third, and that's ground rules. And ground rules cover the rules of a particular field of play. 
Ground rules must be decided by the league prior to games being played. The last thing you want is to start a game and the ball goes into an area and both teams are arguing whether it was dead ball or whether it was not dead ball. So examples of ground rules might include where a dead ball area is located. Uh, what happens if a hit ball contacts a tree that's overhanging the field and the ball drops into fair territory? What do you do in that situation? Well, those are the ground rules that were, will establish that. Every single field should have those. Every league should publish those. And if you're doing interleague, you should send all of those ground rules uh, to the ADA for um, that division. Okay, so let's get started. What is new in the 2023 season? Well, every year we end up with new rules. Sometimes we have a lot of new rules. Sometimes we have a few new rules. For the regular playing season, we actually don't have a lot of new rules, but there are some very important ones. So let's go through those. So the first one, I don't want to spend much time on this, is that in case you don't know, now for senior divisions of baseball and softball, there are no more minimum mandatory number of regular season games that a team has to play. For all other divisions, yes. But for senior baseball and softball, you can have a senior softball or baseball team play zero regular season games, and that team can play in all-stars. For all other divisions, there are requirements about how many team, how many games uh, each team must play, but that's off now for the senior division. Okay, this is where the rule book was kind of silent and sometimes umpires would allow it, sometimes they wouldn't. Now it's official, Little League is allowing play calling armbands. Those uh, bands that go on your arm and uh, they'll call in plays to the batter, the pitcher, the catcher. Um, they must be worn on the arm or wrist as designated. You cannot put them in your pocket. You cannot strap them to your belt. Uh, that is not how you can wear them. A pitcher is allowed to wear one, but it must be on the glove hand, not the pitching hand. It must be on the wrist or arm. It must be of a solid color, not white, gray, or optic yellow. And I want to emphasize this because a lot of play calling bands are black and then have a big white spot on them where all the plays are listed. Some of them do not have covers. That play calling armband must be of a solid color. So if you have one where you don't cover up that white part, it's illegal and it has to be removed. So if you're going to get these for your teams, make sure you get the proper ones. Uh, finally, uh, Little League is allowing hair beads. Uh, prior, it was considered jewelry and was not allowed, but hard items to control the hair, such as beads, are now permitted in all divisions of both baseball and softball. This is probably one of the most significant changes that Little League brought about this year. And that is, you've heard me, every single rules clinic, if you've been to them before, emphasizing adults cannot warm up pitchers. Well, guess what? Little League changed its rule, and now adults, managers, and coaches are now permitted to warm up pitchers at all times. That means before the game starts, they can warm them up. In-game warm-ups, as the fields have switched and the catcher is getting his or her gear on, an adult can come out and uh, have, take warm-ups from the pitcher. And also, uh, the, an adult can catch in the bullpen. What I want to emphasize with this rule, however, that Rule 803A has not changed. What 803A of says is that a pitcher is allowed no more than one minute and no more than eight warm-up pitches at the beginning of a game or between innings. So 
if an adult comes out to catch the pitcher and the pitcher throws, and usually in between innings, once the first inning has started, pitcher has already pitched, we usually allow that pitcher about five warm-up pitchers pitches. If that adult takes those five warm-up pitchers, when that catcher comes out, that catcher is not going to have any warm-ups. So be conscious of that if you're an adult who wants to do this. Little League has also revised the run rule this year. So in all divisions of baseball and softball, we used to have a 15 and 10 run rule. Well, now an eight run rule has been added to this. So if a team leads, and this is minor and majors, if a team leads by 15 after three innings, two and a half if the home team is leading, or leading 10 runs after four innings, or eight runs now after five innings, the game is over, no exceptions. For 50, 70 and above, and for softball juniors and above, just add one inning to each statement. So the 15 run rule is in the fourth inning, for example. Now, this is one of those league options. Your league can make a decision, have no run rule or have this run rule. But what you cannot do is pick and choose which ones you want. Oh, we don't want the eight run rule, but we'll go with the 15 and 10. No, you either have 15, 10, and eight, or you have no run rule at all. Know that all interleague baseball and actually all interleague softball will be using this new run rule. Intentional walks. This shouldn't be new for those of you who are familiar with the majors and minors. Um, and for all levels of softball, we have allowed intentional walks without pitches. In other words, a manager can call time. And before a batter has taken a pitch or any time during the at bat, and the coach, the manager can simply tell the umpire, we want to intentionally walk this batter without pitches. Uh, the batter is walked, and then the number of pitches it would have taken to walk that pitcher are added to the pitch count. So this rule, however, has now been added to all levels of baseball. So intentional rock walks without pitches is now being used by all levels of softball and baseball. However, this is where the rule is new for all levels. A player may only be intentionally walked without pitches once in a game. So you have a player who just hits home runs all the time. You can only intentionally walk that player without pitches only once during that game. Can you intentionally walk them all the other times? Absolutely. But you have to throw the pitches all the other times. Okay, that's it for the new rules. Know that there are incredibly important new rules that are going to be in all stars. So I would suggest that you um, absolutely at all star time, make it to one of the clinics we run about that. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about regulations. And I'm, again, I'm not going to go through a whole lot of them, but there are some that I want to highlight. Um, Mandatory play. This is what makes Little League unique. Listen, you can play on a travel ball club team and you can pay $3,000 for that experience. And uh, as a player, you can never actually play in the game because there aren't mandatory uh, play requirements. In Little League, there is. Each rostered player at the start of a game must have a minimum of one at bat and play a minimum of six defensive outs. Leagues can mandate more. So I strongly suggest look at your local rules, see if your league mandates more. Some leagues mandate nine defensive outs, for example. Now, there are no exceptions for shortened games. And I hear a lot of surprise about this, but what about if the game is shortened because of a time limit? What about the run rule? What if there was a 15 run uh, uh, rule and the game ended in the third inning? What if we have a regulation game, but it was called for darkness in the fifth inning? It 
does not matter. There are no exceptions. Players must meet this. However, obviously, there are going to be situations where not every player can meet it. So what then happens? Do we say, oops, oh, well, maybe next time? No. If a player doesn't meet mandatory play, the penalty is that player must start the next game, start the next played game that they are at. And that player then must start that game, finish meeting mandatory play from the previous game. Say the previous game, they had one at bat and only three defensive outs. Well, they need to play three defensive outs to meet the requirement for that pass game. Now they must stay in that game and not be removed until they meet mandatory play for that game also. And only at that point can they be removed. Um, for managers who continually violate this and do it knowingly, uh, there can be penalties placed on them by their local leagues. What does it mean to bat at least one time for the purposes of meeting mandatory play? It means a player assumes the position of a batter with no count. You step in the batter's box, zero, zero count. And one of the following happens. You're retired as a batter. Say you strike out or you fly out. Uh, you're retired as a batter runner. You're thrown out at first base or you make it to first base. And then in the next pitch, you try to steal second and are thrown out at second. Or you reach base and then you score. Or you reach base and then the inning or the game ends. If any of those happens, you have met your requirement for an at-bat. To meet this mandatory play, the very first time a player comes up to bat, they must meet that mandatory play. Retired as a batter, retired as batter runner, reaches base scores, reaches base and the inning or game ends. What does this mean? The very first time a batter comes up to bat uh, and it's discovered, for example, that they are batting out of order you cannot play, replace that batter. They must stay in the batter's box, even though it's the wrong, wrong batter. If that batter makes it to base, they cannot be removed for a courtesy runner or be removed for a special pinch runner. So that's the mandatory play offensively. Now, in terms of six defensive outs, that's pretty plain and simple. You gotta be out on defense for six defensive outs. They don't have to be consecutive. Um, in the minor division, if a team you, uses the five run rule um, and um, a half inning for a half inning, and say a team scores five runs and no outs have been made, Little League considers that the equivalent of three defensive outs. So, minor division. Uh, even if you have a five-run inning, if you play defense that entire inning, you have met the uh, three defensive outs, whether any outs were made or not. Okay, we're still in um, the regulations. So here are some prior to and during a game. Only managers, coaches, players, and umpires are allowed on the field. There can be no parents. There can be no friends out uh, in the field. Uh, there can be none of those folks in the dugout either. There can only be three adults per team allowed, even during warmups. So when your team arrives at the field and they go out on the field to start taking their infield and out outfield and batting practice, know that there can only be three adults. Maybe you have four coaches, and you want to have all four of those adults out there, you cannot do it. For those of you who are here as umpires, know that when you get onto that field, start counting. How many adults are there? If a team has more than uh, three, go up to the manager, find out who the manager is, introduce yourself, be pleasant, and say, hey, we can only have three adults. 
So one of these adults has to leave. Which one will it be leaving now? And make sure they leave the field. In non-competitive minors and T-ball, they can have up to four adults. Know that for all District 4 interleague games, you can only have three. During the game, no bat boys, no bat girls. Players have to remain in the dugout unless they're out on the field or their base coaches, they're playing, they're out on the field, their base coaches, or they're in the bullpen warming up. They can't be wandering around. Again, managers, you have to be responsible for this. Umpires, if you see players uh, just wandering around, stop the game. Have the manager get his uh, players in line. Only players allowed in the dugout. No friends. Uh, yeah, a parent can pass some seeds through or whatever. That's fine. Um, and if a child is injured and a parent needs to check on that child in the dugout, we allow that. But otherwise, only the coaches, only the players in that dugout. There must be an adult coach or manager in the dugout at all times when there are players in that dugout. This is a safety rule, no exceptions. As uh, umpires, again, if you see that, that there's two adults out on the field as base coaches, no adult in the dugout, stop the game and make sure an adult gets in that dugout and no one else allowed in the dugout. Okay, uh, we're on to regulation one. And what I wanna emphasize here is that um, Little League is a game. In fact, in, if you go to regulation one, this is in the first sentence of that, regu of that regulation. Little League baseball, and it's also listed for softball, in all divisions is a game. Let's never, ever lose sight of the, that. These are kids. They are all kids. It is a game. Let's have them have fun in a safe environment. This is posted outside Pleasanton Little League uh, fields. And I think it's something that should be posted outside all Little League fields. Reminders from your child, I'm just a kid. It's just a game. My coach is a volunteer. The officials are humans. No college scholarships will be handed out today. In other words, there is no reason for anyone to be yelling or to be hostile. Okay, and remember, we're focusing on minors and majors in this rules clinic. So on deck batters, majors and minors, no on deck batters are allowed. Between the half inning, one batter is allowed out for each half inning, but that is the only time that player can come out with a bat before that. This is actually from the safety appendix in the Little League rule book, and it has to do with handling of bats in the dugout. There are no handling of bats in the dugout. A player cannot touch a bat in the dugout unless that player is getting up to pick up that bat, to then go out on the field to bat, or coming off the field to place that bat back on the batting rack. Players cannot stand with bats. They cannot swing bats around. It is a safety issue. Why do we care about this? Watch at the top of the dugout steps. You have a batter who's warming up with a weighted bat. That's somebody who's going to go off and get stitches and will not be playing in that game. Think of it this way. A major league dugout is so much bigger than one of our little league dugouts. Adults are so much more conscious of their surroundings than a 10-year-old kid. But even in this situation, it can still happen. We don't allow kids and bats in the dugout. We don't want anybody hurt. Little League is about safety. Let's always emphasize safety. Minors and majors, no metal cleats are allowed. If there's cleats, they have to be those hard plastic uh, cleats. 
No casts, including soft casts, are allowed on the field, players, coaches, and umpires. If you have a player in a cast, they are going to spend their time on the bench. If you have a coach with a cast, they will not come out on the field at all. Jewelry, no jewelry is allowed. Uh, so you see those uh, um, necklaces, not allowed. Rubber ear band, or, um, wristbands, not allowed. Uh, jewel, uh, jewelry piercings, not allowed. The only thing Little League now allows, uh, actually those hard hair pieces, but it's used to control the hair. But the only thing you can have is a medical alert bracelet or a medical alert necklace that a player can have. And we absolutely encourage players to have that. And I would encourage managers that if you have a player who has one of those and there are umpires in your league who are constantly umpiring, talk to them, let them know what that player has so that we're also aware of that. Again, always looking out for the safety of these kids. Equipment check. It's listed in the Little League rule book that we must, as umpires, check equipment prior to every single game. I know there have been some leagues that have not done this, but it is uh, it should be done. What are we going to be looking for? Well, let's go through it. What you're going to be checking are the batting helmets. You are going to make sure that they have that knock say standard. Um, you're going to make sure that the helmets don't have any cracks in them. You're going to make sure that all of the padding that is supposed to be there is there. If part of that padding is missing, that helmet gets tossed. It is not going to be used because it's not meeting the manufacturer's standards. If you have a cage on the front of the helmet, make sure that all the screws are in that are supposed to be. Make sure they are tight. Otherwise, toss that helmet. Uh, <laughs> Helmet flaps, a lot of times we refer to these as uh, C flaps. These are allowed in Little League. Um, there is a rule that the helmet manufacturer notice should be available to the umpire. Generally, that's never going to happen. But what are the two things that we absolutely will always emphasize with these C flaps? One, no new holes have been drilled in the helmet. Only holes that have been already pre-drilled by the manufacturer will be allowed. And the manufacturer of the flap must match the manufacturer of the helmet. If you have a Rawlings helmet, you need a Rawlings C flap. Down below on the left side, you can see a generic C flap. Those will never be allowed in Little League. They will get tossed. Um, those are the rules. Please don't argue with umpires over that. What else about helmets? They can't have excessive stickers. Um, yes, there can be some stickers. Actually, what's the rule of thumb with Little League? No more than 20% of the helmet can be covered in stickers. Those stickers can absolutely not cover anything that has any kind of a safety uh, applique or the Nox insignia. These two helmets on the side here, really the, the uh, uh, on the one, the uh, decals, the stickers are too large, larger than a silver dollar. On the one below, they're starting to fill up too much of that helmet. So we're not gonna allow that. We're also not going to allow reflective helmets and we will absolutely not allow any helmet that's been painted post-production by anything, anybody other than the manufacturer. Okay, catcher's gear. What does the catcher have to wear and when do they have to wear all their gear? When can they wear just some of their gear? Well, when there's infield outfield practice, when you're warming up before the game and the coach is hitting uh, the balls to the outfield and you have a catcher right near them, if they are near a bat, they have to have a catcher's helmet and it must have a dangling throat guard. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, if, the, uh, if the coach is just simply throwing the ball, Catcher doesn't need a helmet, but anytime they get near a bat, have to have that helmet on. A catcher warming up a pitcher in a squat position 
either in between innings or in a bullpen, have to have a catcher's helmet with a dangling throat guard. If you're a male, you need to have a protective cup and you need to wear a catcher's mitt. You can't use a regular glove. And then obviously during the game, what do you need? Catcher's helmet, dangling throat guard. You need the cup. You need the catcher's mitt. You also then need the chest protector and the shin guards. Well, what about that new rule? If an adult is warming up a pitcher, they are required to wear absolutely no protective equipment. We'll let natural selection take its way. Okay, catcher's helmet. Um, what are we looking for with this? Once again, just like a batter's helmet, we're looking for any kind of cracks, deterioration. Uh, we're looking for that all the screws are in and screwed tightly for that face guard. We're looking inside to make sure all the padding is there. If some of the padding is gone, then we're not going to allow that. We're going to make sure it has the knock say signa, uh, insignia, and we will absolutely make sure that there is a dangling throat guard. That means that that throat guard isn't so tight to the mask that when the player lifts their head, that throat guard doesn't move. It must be dangling. A good rule of thumb, there should be about a two finger space between the bottom of the mask and the throat guard. It doesn't matter if you wear a hockey style helmet, you have to have that throat guard. I would say over the last, I don't know how many years, uh, the most grief I get as an umpire is teams uh, getting angry at me for enforcing this. But I can tell you as an umpire who has gotten hit right at the Adam's apple um, and had my mask on and was wearing one of these and the ball didn't even touch my chin, but hit only the throat guard, I can say that I couldn't breathe for a little bit. And I also couldn't swallow for a couple of minutes. And I couldn't umpire for about five minutes. If I had not had that, I would have been in the hospital. No skull caps are allowed for catchers in Little League, all levels. Why do we care that catchers wear their gear when they're in the squat position and they're warming up a pitcher? Because you know what? Kids don't always catch the ball. And sometimes pitchers throw balls that the catcher isn't expecting. All of a sudden, there's a rise ball in softball. There's a curve ball in baseball. And this happens. So we will always require those catchers to wear those helmets. Again, safety, 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 safety. Okay, let's talk about bats. We're gonna talk about two kinds of bats. One is a defective bat, the other is an illegal bat. So let's talk about a defective bat first. This is a bat that's damaged. It's cracked, it's dented, uh, it's um, um, a two-piece bat, and you can move the bat back and forth uh, there's too much looseness between the one part and the other part. It has sharp edges. These bats are defective. They're not illegal. And what do we do? We want them removed from the game. So you'll see us umpires before games go through and check every single bat, run our hands across the bat, check for dents, check for cracks. If it's a two-piece bat, we're going to be putting torque on it to make sure there is not a separation occurring. Why do we care about this? Because a broken metal bat is a piece of shrapnel and it can hurt or kill a child, a coach or manager or an umpire. I want you to look right around at the umpire's head through this. That broke off right at the handle. 
fortunately it missed him. And if it, uh, it may have grazed him a little bit. Uh, and fortunately it wasn't the sharp end uh, heading right at him. So that's why we wanna remove bats. Uh, this picture comes to me, comes to us uh, via Shannon Self from uh, Walnut Creek Little League. This is a softball bat uh, and a player hit a ball and the bat just broke in half and part of it went flying. So this is that reason why we're always checking those bats. We're not going to catch everything. But we're going to try to catch what we can. Now, all of that was a defective bat. If a batter steps into a, uh, in the batter's box with a defective bat, we just remove it, you know? Um, but what about an illegal bat? That's a different critter. So what is an illegal bat? An illegal bat is an altered bat. The cap has been taken off and the inside has been shaved down or that it doesn't meet the proper length or diameter requirements or that it doesn't have the proper logo or the logo is unreadable. And we'll talk about what those logos are. All BPF marked bats are illegal in Little League Baseball. If you have a BPF bat, it is not allowed in any division of Little League Baseball. A bat with pine tar or adhesive substance is an illegal bat. Well, what if that pine tar is dried? The rule book doesn't say sticky pine tar. It says pine tar. If a, a bat has pine tar, remove it. It is an illegal bat. What's the penalty if a batter actually steps into the batter's box uh, with an illegal bat and it's discovered before the next batter enters the box? Well, the batter's out. And if a play occurs at bat, the defensive manager may decline or accept the penalty. Kid hits a home run, you're going to take the penalty and have the batter out. If the kid hits into a double play, chances are you're going to take the, uh, you're going to accept the play and not the penalty. But no matter if you accept the, if the manager accepts the penalty or not, in each case, the first violation, you lose an adult base coach position. That doesn't mean you kick an adult off the team for that game. It means they have to sit in the bench and it means you have to have a player out at either first or third base with a helmet on to be the base coach. Second violation, manager's gone. Uh, any subsequent violation, whoever the new manager is, is ejected. But what's most important beyond the penalties, remove the bat, they are dangerous. And if you are called out for an illegal bat, guess what? You've met your at bat for mandatory play. Okay, so minors and majors baseball. If you want to know about softball, you want to know about teenage baseball, come to the other clinics. Minors and majors baseball. Diameter of the barrel of the bat, two and five eighths inches maximum. Length, 33 inches maximum or shorter. Uh, wood bats, absolutely okay. And if you have a wood bat, you don't need a logo. If you have a non wood bat, it must have the USA bat logo on it. That is the only logo that is allowed. BPF and BB Core are illegal bats. So at the top here, you see USA Baseball. That will be what you will see in every single bat in Little League major, majors and minors. And if it shows a bat that has BPF or BB Core, it is an illegal bat. Um, fortunately, we don't really have to worry about these rubbing off because USA Baseball has put the logo uh, generally right above uh, the grip. So that's where you will see it very easy to see. Uh, one other thing about bats, no traditional batting donuts are allowed. Can you have a batting sleeve? Absolutely. But those round batting donuts, um, since I've been involved in Little League for 20 plus years, they have never been allowed. Um, it's a safety issue. Okay, Don, we are to a question period. Do we have questions? So Jim, we have one question relating to the new rule regarding um, adults warming up pitchers. I think you covered this, but just for clarity, um, 
can can the the question is can the adult um, warm up a pitcher off the field somewhere like in a bullpen or outside the fence and then does that adult need to be part of the coaching staff or can it be like their additional coach or a parent of the player during the this is during a game okay very good question um Remember all those players, where do they need to be? They need to be on the field, they need to be in the dugout, or they need to be in the bullpen, they can't be anywhere else. So they need to be, if they're warming up, they need to be uh, in a bullpen. Now I realize that some fields don't have a dedicated bullpen area, but there will always be an area where that league has said, this is an okay area for pitchers to warm up. It's usually away from uh, spectators. Can it be an adult other than a coach or a manager? Absolutely not. Um, once that game starts, the only people who are going to be involved with those kids are going to be the manager and up to two coaches. Uh, so it cannot be uh, another uh, parent. Also remember, if you have two uh, adult base coaches, and the adult in the dugout wants to warm up the pitcher, they cannot because they cannot leave that dugout. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Can you explain why the traditional donut is not allowed? Yes, I've heard two reasons for it. Um, one is that it uh, can break down the integrity of the bat that it can dent the bat. Uh, the second is the possibility of those rings flying off. They are rubber coated, but one of the things is if you'll notice the older ones, many times have cuts in them, water gets in there, they get rusted, uh, and they may not be designed for the size of that bat also. So that's as far as I know. Okay, we've got one more. Um, with an intentional walk, if no pitches had been thrown to the batter, does the pitch count get an additional four pitches? Yes, it does. Okay, we have one more question. This is a safety question. What about mouthpieces and other guards that might not be specifically listed in the rule book? Are those mandatory? They are not mandatory, but if a player wants to wear a mouth guard, they are free to wear a mouth guard. Okay, I think that's it, Jim. Okay, thanks. Good to hear questions on uh, safety. Always appreciate that. Okay, now we're going to start talking about rule two definitions. This is really the heart of the rule book. Um, the definitions uh, are then used throughout the rule book. Um, and to understand rules one and three through nine, you have to understand the definition of terms. And that's where you get from rule two. So what I would say to all of you is if you don't have a time to read through the entire rule book, or maybe you just have time for a little bit, start with rule two, read the definitions, and then start going through the other rules. So we're going to go through some of these rules. And I realize for some of you, um, you've heard this stuff, you know this stuff, it may be a little bit boring, but for many others of you who are new to umpiring, these are very, very important things to know. So first we're going to talk about uh, fair and foul territory. Now we start with the playing field. The playing field is everywhere within that fence. It's uh, foul territory, it's fair territory. So what is the uh, fair territory part of it? It's that playing field, on or above the playing field, within and including the foul lines. 
So really, in many respects, a foul line should be called a fair line because those lines are in fair territory. All bases, including home base, is in fair territory. So if you look at this diagram here, everything that's white, everything that's kind of that puke colored infield and the dark green for the grass, that is all fair territory. And it extends out to the base of the outfield fence. I wanna highlight uh, a phrase here on or above, we'll come back to that. So know that the fair territory is on and above the playing field. If that's fair territory, what's foul territory? Well, pretty much anything left over uh, that's not, <clears throat> uh, uh, that's outside of those foul lines. So you can see this blue area here, that would be our foul territory. We also have another area that's very, very important, and that's called dead ball area. This is any area beyond a physical boundary, beyond a fence. Um, many fields are completely fenced in. So it's everything that's on the other side would be a dead ball area, for example. Uh, dugouts are dead ball area by definition. Bleachers, stands, dead ball area. Now, it may be that your fence doesn't extend all the way around and your fence only goes part way. Well, we call this fence line extended. We take that fence and we create an imaginary line beyond it. And that is anything on the other side is going to be a dead ball area. Sometimes that's roped off. Sometimes we have a chalk line. Many times, quite frankly, we don't have that luxury. So as an umpire, know if you have to figure out if a ball is just in foul territory or has entered dead ball area with a short fence, you have to go over to that fence and be able to look down it and see where is that ball? Is it in the dead ball area or is it in foul territory? What's also dead ball area? Well, anywhere where a ball can be lodged in a fence, in a backstop, um, in a catcher's or umpire's equipment, that is also considered dead ball area if a ball becomes lodged in there. When a player with a ball, say they made a catch, and they step into dead ball area, that is an immediate time. We kill the play, time. So you can catch a ball over dead ball area. That's fine as long as you're standing in the field of play. But once one of your feet touches outside of that field of play onto a dead ball area, time, if you have control of a ball. So these are examples of some dead ball area, ball that gets stuck in the fence. Uh, you can see that with the padding, a ball can get stuck um, in between the pads. Uh, there's uh, Benji Molino. Molina, um, ball got stuck to his chest protector. Uh, he claims there was no uh, pine tar involved in that. Uh, and below, we see a ball that was actually lodged in a, an umpire's uh, shirt pocket and know that um, that sometimes balls gets lodged in our uh, ball bags that we are, we wear. Those are dead ball areas. Anytime a ball does any of those things, call time. Okay, let's talk about the strike zone. The strike zone is that area which is from the armpits. So it's actually fairly high up on a batter. Um, you'll hear coaches say, you know, complain about the letters. Well, we don't go by the letters. We go by the armpit and the top of the knees and a ball that's over home plate. So you can see in the red, there's been sort of this imaginary box that was drawn that's over home plate between uh, 
the armpits and the top of the knees. And if the ball goes through, even a portion of that ball goes through any part of that, that is a strike. Also, we look at the batter's natural stance and we look at the batter's usual stance when swinging at a pitch. There are players that will bend over pretty far and try to make themselves smaller, but what do they do when they swing at the ball? That's what we're looking at. Now, um, this is a home plate. Both of those balls are strikes. They both catch a corner of the white. Uh, the black is actually a bevel. It's technically not part of the strike zone. But I want to emphasize for Little League, you're not going to be calling strikes like that in the minors or majors. Absolutely not. What we usually do as umpires is we will give a ball inside and maybe up to two balls outside. We will never call strikes that are unhittable balls. We will never absolutely exaggerate our strike zone, but we will give our pitchers a little bit of an advantage. Why? We want to encourage pitchers and we want to encourage our players to swing. There is plenty of time in the years to come for those players as they move up to develop a finer and a finer eye for a strike zone. This, remember, natural stance. Is this a natural stance? This was actually at the Little League World Series. This player tried this. And if you watch, as the ball comes in, he starts to stand up. How do you deal with that? You tell the kid, knock it off, or you just start calling strikes because you can't really judge what his strike zone is because you know, and this kid had already been up to bat before and he stood straight up and he had a full strike zone. So we knew what his strike zone was before that. Okay, let's talk about what a strike and what a ball is. And I want to go through this, and then we're going to talk about fair foul. We need to know this. Why? Because if you're a plate umpire, you are going to make your living on calling balls and strikes fair and foul. It's two of the most important things a plate umpire will do. So you got to know absolutely what these are. So. A strike is a pitch that crosses the strike zone and is not struck at. In other words, the umpire calls a strike and the batter didn't uh, swing. Struck at and missed. Swing and a miss. That's also going to be a strike. If the ball is fouled with less than two strikes, that is a strike. A foul tip is a strike no matter the strike count. And we'll talk a little bit more about what a foul tip is. Offering a bunt is a strike. It's just the, it's the same thing as trying to swing at a ball. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about what a bunt is. Bunting a ball foul with two strikes. That's your third strike. If a pitched ball touches a batter, on the swing. In other words, it can be coming straight at the batter and that batter is in the batter's box. If they actually swing at that pitch and it hits them, that is a strike. The hands are not part of the bat. How do we know this? Go to any uh, sporting goods store. Go to the baseball, softball section, go to the bat section. There are no hands attached to those bats. When the players come into the dugout and they place their bat down, their hands stay with them, not with the bat. So it doesn't matter where on the body a, a ball hits them. It is still hit them. And if they're swinging, it's going to be called a strike. It's also a dead ball. Any time a batter is hit with a ball, we call time. Whether they're swinging or not, we kill that play. So your first response, a kid in the batter's box gets hit, come up, time. 
What is also a strike? A strike is a pitch that touches the batter in flight in the strike zone. This is for those batters that crowd the strike zone and their hands are over the strike zone. And the ball comes in and it hits their hand. The ball went through the strike zone. Time, because we have a hit batter, and we call a strike and we will not award first base. So this first example is a pitched ball and it hits the batter in the strike zone. The batter, it actually does, it's sort of unclear where it hits the batter, but it hits the batter in the hand and uh, the batter doesn't swing. But this should have been called time, that's a strike. So look at the location of the ball between the armpits and the top of the knees. And also watch where this ball would have gone had it not hit the batter. You can see where that catcher's glove was. So that is a batter who is crowding the plate and was hit inside the strike zone. Here is an example of a batter swinging and getting hit in the hands. The hands are not part of the bat. What do we have here? We have time, that's a strike. And we keep the batter there, unless that's the third strike. Okay, well, if that's a strike, what's a ball? Well, kind of the opposite on a couple of them. It's a ball that doesn't enter the strike zone and is not struck at. That is a ball, plain and simple. If a ball bounces through the strike zone and is not struck at, it is a ball. Anytime a pitch hits the ground before the plate, it is going to be a ball unless the batter strikes at it and they have every right to strike at it if they want. Okay, what's a foul tip? Foul tip is a batted ball that goes sharp and direct. So it can't sort of, it cannot have an arc to it. it. Has to go straight from the bat, straight back to the catcher. And it first must touch the catcher's hand or mitt. And for folks who think they know little league rules and apply major league rules, know that the major league rule for a foul tip is different than the little league rule. For a foul tip in Little League, the ball has to first touch the catcher's hand or mitt. If it hits their head and then they catch it, it's not a foul tip, it's a foul ball. So sharp and direct, first to the catcher's hand and mitt and is legally caught. This is a live ball. That's important because runners can steal on a foul tip. Runners can advance at their own risk. So here's an example of a foul tip. Batted ball, sharp and direct, first to the catcher's glove, and, and is legally caught. Now watch the umpire coming out. We'll give a foul tip signal. Signaling to everybody, that's a foul tip. We have a live ball. Um, here we have an example of not a foul tip because the ball, although sharp and direct, does not first go to the catcher's mitt or hand. He tries to sell it. Umpire's a little confused, but it doesn't touch his mitt first. It touches his body. Catches it, but it doesn't matter. That's a foul ball. A bunt. A bunt is a batted ball not swung at, but intentionally met with a bat and tapped slowly. So anytime a bat is swung, we're not going to have a bunt. 
the bat must intentionally meet uh, the player must intentionally try to meet that bat with the ball, tap it slowly. The mere holding of the bat in the strike zone is not an attempted bunt. So if a player squares around, holds the bat in the strike zone, and the ball comes in, and it's not a strike, and the player just stands there with the bat like that uh, in front of the, in the strike zone, but doesn't move it, that is not a strike. That is not attempting a bunt. They must attempt to meet that bat with uh, the ball. Softball has a very different rule. So go to the softball clinic if you want to know that one. T-ball, bunts aren't permitted. Should seem obvious. Okay. Um, let's talk about fair and foul balls. So again, you know, a lot of you know this, but a lot of you may not. And I really want to emphasize it because this is the kind of stuff that you're going to be calling over and over and over during a game through the course of a season. So let's talk about fair ball, foul ball. What makes a hit ball a fair ball? Well, it has to meet a number of different requirements. Each one of them means it's a fair ball. So a ball that settles on fair territory before first or third base. In other words, a bunt where the ball goes out in front of the home plate and it dies and it stops moving. If it's on fair territory, notice I talked earlier about on or over. In this case, it's on fair territory. It is a fair ball. If it's a ball that's hit, a grounder that bounds on or over fair territory past first or third base, it is a fair ball. So this is a grounder. And if you have grounders that are going up the lines as umpires, you need to get on those lines and you need to watch carefully. And what matters to you in this case is when that bounding ball goes over first or third base, is it in fair or foul territory? If it's over uh, the base, remember, bases are in fair territory, it is a fair ball. If it first lands, the ball first lands on fair territory beyond first or third base, what's this? This is a fly ball, this is a line drive that gets out of the infield and then first lands. If it lands in fair territory, on fair territory, it is a fair ball beyond first and third. A ball that touches first and third base. So remember, first and third base are in fair territory. This is one of the easiest calls you have. If somebody hits a ball, a ball and it hits first or third base, you know it's a fair ball. Call a fair ball. If it touches a person on or over fair territory. So this is a grounder that uh, bounces off a fielder's shin or that bounces off a glove or that is caught, that is fielded with the glove or that is caught in the fly. Where did it touch that person? Where did it touch that glove? Was it on or over fair territory or on or over foul territory? It doesn't matter if the player was in fair or foul territory. That matters nothing. Watch where the ball touches. Did it touch over or on fa fair territory? It's a fair ball. Or passes out of the playing field in flight over fair territory. There you got a home run. Well, if those are a fair ball, what are foul balls? really the opposite. Uh, that ball that settles before first or third, that bunt that stops moving, but stops moving on foul territory. That bounding grounder that goes past first or third, but instead of over, over or on fair territory, goes in foul territory. A ball that first lands on foul territory beyond first or third base. In other words, that fly or line drive that when it first touches, it touches foul territory, it's a foul ball. 
or that touches a person or foreign object on or over fair, foul territory. If the ball is touched in foul territory, first, it's going to be a foul ball. What do we mean by foreign object? Well, hopefully it isn't that some other player left a bat out there uh, at the previous at bat, but what we generally mean by this is uh, a drop bat. The batter swings, drops the bat, and the ball rolls and hits a bat in foul territory. That's a foreign object. Kill the play at that point. It's a foul ball. Okay, fair and foul. Notice who cares where he's standing. What matters is where did he touch the ball? This is first baseline. He first touched the ball over fair territory. It's a fair ball. Here, again, forget about where he's standing. Where did he first touch the ball? He touched the ball over foul territory. It is a foul ball. Okay, we're going to watch some uh, fair balls here. And one of the things I want to emphasize with these is, especially for you who are newer umpires, wait until somebody touches the ball, unless it's an obvious foul ball that ricochets off the fence. Um, um, but wait till somebody touches the ball. You don't know what that ball can do. It can curve, it can hit uh, grass and, and uh, go back into foul, fair territory from foul territory. It can hit a rock and change direction. Be patient before you call your fair foul. So, foul at this point, but guess what? Where was it first touched before first or third? It was first touched on or over fair territory. Those are fair balls. That's what matters. Where was it touched? Fair at that point. Again, easiest call you'll ever have as an umpire. It touches the base. It's a fair ball. That ball touched first base. It's a fair ball. Touch third base, fair ball. Where did it bound? Did it bound past first or third base in fair or foul territory? It started in foul, but look where it's bounding over in fair territory. This one again started in foul but then curve back into fair territory past first base, over first base, fair ball. Fly ball, first touches, touched in fair territory. Why? Because the foul lines are in fair territory. So that's a fair ball. We tell umpires to try to get their belt buckle on the line. And it's very important, and it's especially important when fielders are running towards the line and it makes all the difference in the world. Did that ball touch get touched in fair or foul territory? If it's caught, really doesn't matter. But what if that field, fielder touches the ball but doesn't catch the ball? So watch this one. These are some of the hardest plays to call in baseball. Was it touched over fair or foul territory? That determines whether it was a fair or foul ball. And guess what? He drops it. But look at that umpire with belt buckle and head on line. He is in the perfect position to be able to call that. Okay, Don, do we have any questions? Jim, we have one um, question. So this is a clarity question. We get this often, right? It's about if a batter hits the pitch and it strikes home plate and then goes into the infield, is it considered a fair ball? Yes, it is. And uh, home plate doesn't have any special qualities about it when we're hitting balls. Um, uh, home plate, just like uh, first, second, and third, are all in fair territory. 
So if the ball hits home plate, it doesn't matter. What matters is where did the ball settle? Where was the ball first touched? And did the ball bound past first or third in fair or foul territory? That is what's going to matter. Also, if a ball hits straight down and stops moving on home plate, home plate is in fair territory. It is a fair ball. Yeah, that's all the questions we have. Okay, uh, we are at 8.17. So we are going to stop now. We have some more definitions to go through. You can see what, but we're not gonna go through these. We will go through these next time. You can see we have some great videos coming up with that. So this is what I wanna end with. I wanna remind you, this was our February 8th presentation. We're gonna have one February 15th. Beginning and ending the game, batters and runners, and we're going to finish up with uh, rule two definitions. So that's what we're going to have next time. Remember that we have another session on the 22nd and one on the 1st. You have to register for each one of these individually. So please do that. And also remember, we have the Teenage Baseball Rules Clinic by Zoom, and that's going to be on the 23rd at 7 p.m. register uh, at District 4 on the baseball page. And I wanna remind you of the softball rules clinic. So if any of you are gonna be doing teenage baseball, softball rules, and your umpires, you really absolutely should attend those clinics because there are rules that are different than what we are going through here. Don, any last questions or comments? I think we're good, Jim. Okay. Look forward to next week. Okay. Hey, folks, thanks for taking your time out, you know, busy schedules um, uh, to attend this. 